So, so what a great way to, to start. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm absolutely thrilled and delighted that we're gonna introduce um, our speaker for today. Uh, this is uh, our, uh, our, our key event. It's a Black History Month celebration. We're delighted to have a fantastic speaker um, wh whose work really speaks to the challenges of environmental sustainability, racial justice, um, and really connecting communities together. So I'm absolutely thrilled that we're having this discussion. Um, I'm going to introduce, we're gonna do a double introduction. My introduction is going to be to, to have you all meet uh, Thea Lewis, who is one of our um, master's students. She's an absolutely fantastic master's student. She is really the, the pride of, of C's and is doing a fantastic job in her, her research, in her education. And Thea is going to introduce our speaker today. So over to you, Thea. Just a quick housekeeping note. This is, since it is a webinar, we are gonna have a Q&A. If you have questions, please type them into the Q&A uh, button and we will uh, answer those questions at the end of the talk. Thank you so much. Thea, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Butt. And it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Mrs. Heather McTeer-Tony as the 2021 SEAS Black History Month keynote speaker for this conversation on deepening democracy through equitable climate action. Mrs. Tony is an American politician, environmentalist, attorney, and just all around civil servant. McTeer Tony serves as the first national field director for Moms Clean Air Force, an organization of over 1 million moms and dads who are committed to fighting air pollution and protecting against climate change. Prior to coming to Moms, Heather served as the first African American, first female, and youngest mayor of Greenville, Mississippi. In 2014, she was appointed by President Barack Obama to serve as regional administrator for the Environmental Protection Agency Southeast region. At the EPA, Mrs. Tony was responsible for protecting public health and the environment in the eight Southeastern states, as well as six federally recognized tribes. In this role, she led efforts to promote climate justice, local environmental engagement, and enhance the work life for Region 4's approximately 1,000 employees while effectively managing a budget of more than 500 million US dollars. Known for her energetic and genuine commitment to people, her work has made her a national figure in public service, environmental justice, and community engagement, just to name a few fields. Today, Mrs. Tony addresses how we must embrace climate action as the social justice issue of our time and tear down old stereotypes so that we can build sustainable and resilient alliances to fight effectively together and affirm our common humanity. She has appeared on news outlets such as CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, and Democracy Now!, and has also written for and been featured in numerous papers, including the New York Times and the Washington Post. McTeer Tony was featured in the May 2005 issue of Essence Magazine as one of the 50 most remarkable women in the world. She holds a bachelor's degree from Spelman College in Atlanta and a law degree from the Tulane University School of Law. She loves triathlons and bacon and at any time can be found chasing her toddler or riding in old classic cars with her husband and daughter. It is my absolute privilege to introduce Mrs. Heather McTeer Tony as the C's Black History Month keynote speaker today for deepening democracy through equitable climate action. Mrs. Tony, I will turn it over to you. Thea, thank you so much for that beautiful introduction. I truly appreciate it. And thank you for all of the work that you're doing. I already have heard the outstanding nature of what you are putting forward and it makes my heart swell because it lets me know that we have people who are coming up that are doing the work and getting ready to continue to address the climate crisis that's before us. And to all of you who have joined us today, thank you. I understand you could be a number of different places, but you have stopped to take time to commemorate Black History Month, talk about our democracy, and to think together through solutions that will benefit and be equitable to all of us. Bilal and Amy, I am truly appreciative that you continue to think of me and come together in these types of conversations that are truly fitting for our time. 
And boy, what a time it is. When I reflect back to what happened on January the 6th in our nation, it grips me and it grips me for a number of reasons. I'm the daughter of a retired civil rights attorney and a retired school teacher who made their way from Baltimore, Maryland to the state of Mississippi to advocate for voters' rights. I was raised in a social justice household in the Mississippi Delta, where it was truly a community and a village that raised my brother and I. And so when I looked at the events of the six, the first thing I did was I picked up the phone and called my dad. And I said, what in the world is happening? And in the very calm nature that he has always presented, he said, Heather, this is the difficulties in democracy. This is the ugly side that we reckon with, but this too, we shall get through. And it really made me think about how we address and need to deepen our own democracy because my initial thought was how in the world are we supposed to talk about climate action in a time like this? How when all things around us seem to be going uh, left and right and focusing on the very systemic nature of our government, how can I convince people that they should think about the climate crisis? But it's in the democracy, it's in the actual event and thinking through how we make this uh, deeper in our country that climate equity and climate action rises to the top. I raise that as a starting point because even today, I know many of you have either heard, watching the news, seeing what's happening with the impeachment hearings, you're on Twitter or Facebook or somewhere constantly up, uh, being updated as to what happens. But we often don't attach that to the very, very active climate reality of crisis and actions that are taking place. And we have to put the two together. So let's think about it. When we talk about what our democracy means and actually deepening our democracy, we have to go back to the very beginning of what it is. It's the political control. It is the will of the people to lead and to govern as a group, as a collective together, by the people, for the people, all of the people together. But in that very phrase, there is a reality that we must embrace. And that is that it's never been all of the people, truly. Our country has had to deal with systemic racism from the very beginning. From the time that African Americans and indigenous people were not considered full human beings to where we are in 2021 and seeing the white supremacy that continues to attack the very systems of our government. It forces us to reckon with the very word democracy and with our own internal conversations of do we really, really mean what this word means. I'm encouraged when I think about you as students, when I think about and I reflect upon who has gone uh, to the polls, who has made uh, sure that we are ushering in a period in time when democracy really means the true definition of the word. Because it is through you that we get the mandate of what we will do next. Here's an example. In the 2020 elections, there have been, uh, there were a number of studies that were done, but the one that I really enjoy comes from Tufts University. And it showed, laid out and explained how through voters between the ages of 18 and 35, particularly voters of color, climate action was a mandate. Now this is important because this took place even in the midst of coronavirus, in the midst of racial un, uh, uh, unrest and mistrust, in the midst of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, all of the things that we know were happening in 2021. Voters between the ages of 18 and 35 still ranked climate action as one of the number one things that needed to be done and they voted on it. It was Sunrise Movement, Zero Hour, Climate Fridays, Alexandria Villasenor, it was Greta Thunberg. It was an entire movement of people who have said that we recognize that in order to really move forward as a country, we have to be part of the global movement of addressing the climate crisis. And that crisis does not go away, whether or not we believe that 
we are being treated equally or not, we still have to deal with it. So why not do both at the same time? That mandate is what has brought us to a place now where we can continue to push for strong climate action and ensure that it is equitable as a way to show that our democracy is true and it exists and is important for all people. Climate action and climate justice is the social justice movement of our time. There is not a single subject you can think about that you can raise, that you can come away with, that climate does not touch in some shape, form, or fashion. Think about education. Well, climate and education, there have already been studies that have, that have taken place that shows that in urban areas, heat islands, where we have uh, increased temperatures, particularly in communities of colors, test scores fail, test scores drop because students are in a position where they're not able to learn as their counterparts are simply due to the temperature of the climate. Police brutality, well, guess what? There are studies that have been done on that as well that shows where you have increased temperatures, there are increased violence. We can talk about healthcare, we could talk about government, we could talk about any social justice movement that you can think of and climate is attached to it. These are the things that make us recognize that if we're able to address climate action in an equitable way, at the same time, we're able to address other issues that help us to become a better democracy and a better community. And when we begin to really act on those, uh, on those issues, we can begin to see significant change. So climate action is the thing that impacts everybody wherever you are, where, whether you think it does or not. I like to think of it like this. Um, we may not see the wind when it blows, but we feel it. You might not be able to see the chemicals in the air, but you feel it when you breathe it, when your asthma flares up. Climate action, you may not be able to put your hand on it. And there's so many people who have their theories about climate change and whether it exists or not. But the reality is not only is it there, it's happening to us now. How we respond to it is what makes us and allows us to have this opportunity to truly deepen our democracy in it. There's some other things though that we should think about with respect to how we improve our democracy and climate action. And these are the broad transformative areas that oftentimes we miss. See, sometimes we see climate as such a big problem and a world issue that it is so huge to take a chunk out of without going into some deep space of depression and despair. Let me Let's resolve all that right now, okay? <laughs> because I think of it this way. I have kids at home and I wanna make sure that they think of the climate issues and problems as an opportunity. I personally would like to be able to retire someday and sit on a beach alongside my husband and know that this work is being done and continued by the brightest minds across our country. But we have to get there. And we get there by thinking through once again, what are the different ways we can impact this? What are the different spaces that climate enters? What can we do both collectively and individually? And really in marginalized and black and brown communities, this is an opportunity. See, every problem presents us an opportunity to shift and to change. Everything's not gonna be about all um, shutting stuff down. And I know we've got strong advocates and, and social justice people who are in this audience and who are planning uh, for the rest of your careers to be a part of that. At the same time, we need financiers, bankers, lawyers, artists who are able to fulfill and incorporate climate action into everything that we do. So it is understanding that your part or role in this may be seeing how climate action is an economy driver. The Biden administration, for example, has already set out in a number of executive orders and one of the most ambitious climate plans that we have ever seen that there will be up to $2 trillion as a target invested into climate action. 
This includes everything from grid upgrades to electric vehicles to reducing carbon emissions. And on top of that, 40% is targeted to go to communities of color and marginalized areas. So that's a lot of money. The question is, how are we using it? How is it being leveraged? How are we being creative to ensure that this is not just a pass through to other organizations that can continue to uh, do what they do in their spaces, but it's actually being spent and is duplicated and turning within the communities where it is invested into. See, it's one thing to talk about putting electric buses to run through um, poor or black or brown communities because that's the source of public transportation and we are reducing the health impacts when we do that. That's a good thing. It is a very good thing and we absolutely must do it. But in addition to that, we have to ensure that we're using the brownfields that are in those areas. That's the, you know, the gas station that's next to that old basketball court that's been abandoned. We also have to make sure that we're using funding to change that brownfield to a green space, upgrade the basketball court where children are playing to be used with recycled materials with a charging station there that those buses that are going through can charge at. That will allow the energy and the electricity to actually power the lights at the basketball court while having Wi-Fi in the bus to supply the surrounding community. See, it's the way that we think about these interactions and these investments such that they are sustainable in a community, they help build that community and help build the economy and the resilience of the community. That's the brilliance that you bring to it. That's the innovation that we have to think through because that's what puts us into a space of hope versus despair. There's tons of innovative ideas that are out there, many of which I'm sure me and my age of the, you know, the young, very beautiful 45 that I am, uh, there's tons more that you are thinking about each and every day that pushes the envelope even further. What needs to happen is we need to push this envelope together. We have to ensure that we're thinking through the economic opportunities, the opportunities to create energy independence in communities, and to see ourselves as a leader globally as we shift this dynamic of not just ensuring we're protecting our planet, but that the future generations are able to benefit and grow based upon the actions that we are taking place now, that are taking place now. Now, there's another part, the third part of this, that is very, very important to me, and I hope that you um, enjoy and see likewise, <clears throat> and that is the political will. You do not have to wait until you are 40 or 50 years old to be appointed to a board or commission or run for office to make significant change. And hear me well on this. There are brilliant ideas that come from students and young people each and every day that go untapped and unused because you simply do not have the space and voice to put it. And that should change today. There are boards, commissions, races, spaces where you can serve right now and bring those ideas of environmental sustainability to real life situations. All too often, we put ourselves in a box. That means that you look at something in a only singular environmental lens as opposed to expanding it to the many other facets that it could be involved. So it would be me saying that as an attorney and a mom, uh, maybe I don't need to be on the airport board because what do I know about aeronautics? I don't know too much of anything. But what I do know is that it is very important for an airport to use its dollars in a way that is resilient and is creating space for a multitude of different um, options of how we do business. I do know that as a mom, what things are important to me in the future for my kids. 
So simply sitting in those spaces and bringing an environmental lens to issues that typically or traditionally may not be considered environmental is a way that we shift and change policy. It's one of the things that I love that we do at Moms Clean Air Force. It is encouraging mothers and parents to sit on boards and commissions that otherwise they may not have even considered. If we can sit on the PTA board, then certainly we could sit on the transportation board for our community. And the same goes for you. It is what has to happen in terms of interjecting climate and environmental conversations into every aspect of our work. Nothing should go untouched or untapped because there are policies that are being made, but also directed and financed based upon the information that citizens like you and I are sitting and putting at the forefront. Remember, I said that, you know, there was a mandate for climate action. It came very, very clear, and it was very clear who it came from. But now it's time to act on that. Now it's time for us to show up and to make sure that in every aspect of the work that we're doing, we keep a focus of environment, climate, and sustainability moving forward. Our planet depends on it. You and I depend upon it. And we cannot allow the past systemic racisms that have taken place in our country to weaken the democracy that's necessary for climate action to take place. We're on the verge of doing that if we don't stand up and act. We're on the verge of weakening our democracy if we don't include the voices, the very diverse demographics that are concerned about climate, if we don't include them in the conversation. We are on the verge of weakening the very elements that we hold dear and that we say are necessary for us if we do not include climate action in everything that we do. So the very fact that we've seen this past year in 2020 that coronavirus disproportionately impacted communities of color by huge margins, we have to account for the fact that a number of those communities of color were already burdened by air pollution and chronic disease, climate uh, catastrophes that have taken place simply because of where they live. If we do not acknowledge these pieces of our systemic democracy that have held portions of our communities back, then we are weakening what we do moving forward. So you see, it's very important that we understand and connect these dots of climate action. It's critical to the future of our democracy and simply getting things done. It's critical to our role in this planet as a leader among countries of how we do these things because other countries are looking at us. If we're not taking care of the least of us, who are we to tell someone else to do the same? There's a lot of work to do. And I know there's tons that we can think about and I truly hope that your minds are swirling with different ideas, concepts, uh, ingenuity of what should happen. But there are two things I want you to do um, as we move forward in talking about solutions for climate action. First, I want you to find somebody that you can talk to from another country who's actually experienced an attack on their democracy. The reason I say that is because in the United States, we've had a privilege of not seeing what we have seen over the past year. But that does not mean that it does not exist and that they're not colleagues of your own who have seen and been through this very experience. Sometimes we just need to sit down and have a conversation with somebody who does not look like us in order to understand the other aspect. And so that's part of your homework. Have a conversation with someone who is not from a place that you're from about what that experience feels like. And it will help you to understand and put into perspective your own feelings, but also I hope your own determination to ensure that we don't see this again. It'll help you put into perspective what systemic racism can do if we do not address it. 
And then the second thing I want you to do is I want you to think through not the crisis that we are facing, not the, the fact that if we don't make changes, we are going to be in a position that we can't really reverse, reverse. That's bad. I want you to think about what's the solution to ensure that we have hope. What's the solution to ensure that you're able to continue to sustain yourself, your future families, that you're able to have a good life and living? What are the different areas that we have not yet thought about that could benefit from your input of how we come together with equitable solutions around climate? There's a lot of work to do. And I'm so glad that not only are you here and engaged in it, but that you're also thinking about this through a lens of equity, a lens of future, and a focus on what we can truly accomplish in the future. I'm looking forward to a very engaging conversation and questions. Uh, wish I was there with you, but uh, we, we, we will get together one day soon. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Heather, thank you so much. That was so inspiring and completely, completely helpful and very relevant for everything that's going on right now from what's happening in our government to the COVID-19 pandemic that is affecting all of us. We really appreciate you chatting with us today. Um, we have some questions for you. I am just gonna read off one now. Do you believe a carbon price is an important tool for reducing emissions? And if so, can it be implemented in a way that is acceptable to frontline, accessible to frontline slash EJ communities? Very good question. So yes, carbon pricing has been one of those things that has definitely been sort of a wavy dispute of uh, does it work? Can, can it work? Yes, it can work. The problem has been how it has been applied. Um, there has not really been a discussion around the social cost of carbon and then attached to what do the frontline communities need. So it doesn't do any good if we put a, a, a price on carbon and that benefit does not directly impact the people who are right next to the, the, the facility, um, to the frontline or the fence line communities. I think the first step in figuring out how we implement this is to ensure that the communities that are being impacted are at the table. That's number one. We cannot have this conversation about it if the very people who are breathing the air are not there to say what they need as a result of this exchange. They have to be the first beneficiary and be a beneficiary that impacts what I think of as you know, your five physical senses. If I'm not seeing it, tasting it, smelling it, touching it, hearing it, then it's really not something that I'm identifying with. That has to happen within communities. I think a larger organizations, and that's you know the industrial side, also have to assess, again, for this social cost of carbon, but also understanding that things that they may be doing um, in other places or countries has to be attached to, again, that community. So if that, that cost is being offset by trees being planted in the Amazon, it's a beautiful thing. It's wonderful. It's great. At the same time, the people who live right next door to that facility, you know, that little old lady whose carport garage is actually attached to the facility in like Manchester, Houston, um, there, there has to be this identification with the benefit that's helping those people. We're on our way to doing that. I think this administration and uh, a number of large green groups, as well as pressure from both environmental justice groups and um, uh, groups that are trying to do the right thing are making it quite clear that in order to really move forward, we, we're gonna have to do this together and we have to be at that table. That's a terrific answer. Thank you so much. We have one pre-submitted question that I want to make sure we get to. And the question is, you have achieved so many firsts in your career, in your life. What gave you the confidence to strive for your goals? Wow. Mm. Um, that's a good question. <laughs> I, I would say, um, you, you know, again, I have I come from a social justice family. So definitely my parents are hugely influential in 
how I see myself or my role in society. Um, but also that they gave me a sense of um, everybody doesn't arrive, you, you don't arrive till everybody else does. You know, a, a rising tide lifts all, all boats. Um, there's a sense, I think, of um, altruism that I was raised with, uh, along with, quite frankly, my faith. I am a born again Christian from the South. You know, I was one of those kids that went to church on Wednesday night Bible study, Sunday, Saturday, choir rehearsal, you name it. So I am definitely a um, Mississippi Delta raised child in that way. Um, so faith combined with altru with the altruism says to me that, you know, I may be first in some spaces, but I cannot be last. I cannot allow um, these positions or these wonderful accolades to be the only one. And, and you know, we, we've heard that from uh, our vice president, Kamala Harris, you know, she said very clearly, I may be the first, but I will not be the last. And I think the spirit of understanding and doing that is something that urges me on to continue uh, the work. Thank you. We have a related question in the chat. It says, thank you, Heather, for taking the time to speak with us today. You mentioned younger people's getting more involved in political action and leadership roles to help make change at the systematic level. Can you talk a little bit more about what that may look like? How did you decide to enter that space at a young age? Any thoughts on how to enter that space confidently, even if a little on the younger side? Ah, I love it. Don't let anything stop you from doing what you know you you see a passion to do, right? When I um, when I ran for office, I was 27, and I think in some ways, young and dumb to think that, oh, I can, I could do this, like, why not? Young people, you're challenged every single day with people telling you what you can and cannot do. Like, take some of that cockiness and turn it into action to say, I can, you know, there's a saying that I grew up with, which is, you know, I can show you better than I can tell you. Sometimes you have to go ahead and put yourself out there. And quite frankly, you already have the confidence. You just don't see it in the same way. Anybody who can sit in front of a camera and do a TikTok video that is viewed by millions of people across the world, you cannot tell me that you don't have the confidence to stand up in front of a group of people and advocate for something that's important to you. It's there, you're just doing it in different ways. Use the things that you know as your base and your support, because that is what will open the doors to show you that you already have the confidence to do it. Yes, young people, you should go to your mayor um, or your, um, your city council if there's something you're interested in and say, I, want, I have ideas. I'd love to be able to sit in this space. Um, at the same time, be willing to learn, because just as I said I was young and dumb, that gave me some naivete to say, oh my gosh, I might be able to actually do this. I also had to learn some lessons, and lessons of both legacy, listening, deeply understanding issues and problems. Um, it helps to build a foundation to be helpful for folks. So heart in the right place is always a starting point. At the same time, don't let anybody tell you there's something you can't do. Just go show them up differently. <laughs> Thank you. It's totally comprehensive. <laughs> we have another question in the chat, which says, what strategies can we use to weaken or challenge the stranglehold that polluting industries often have on state and local permitting offices? I'm thinking of oil and gas industries, CAFOs, petrochemical industries, and et cetera. This seems like a major barrier to the Biden administration's ambitious pollution reduction and enforcement goals. Yes, yeah, so dealing with petrochemical facilities, CAFOs that are in primarily like North Carolina, South Carolina, if you don't know what those are, CAFOs are controlled animal uh, feeding operations. It's like hog farms or the big 
places where there's a lot of um, environmental injustice that takes place because they're very close to communities of color and impacts like their water system. So just sort of for, for everyone's understanding of what we're talking about, the, the problem has been those industries have had such a stronghold in terms of how they are permitted, uh, how they interact, uh, that they've in some extent been allowed to continue to do so without a lot of real pushback. Um, so to answer the question, I think we have to use a multi-strategy approach. There is no one strategy that will get us over the, the hump of being able to challenge this. There has to be a legal strategy, and I do believe that we'll see a bit more in this administration for use of the Civil Rights Act of 64, Title VI. We'll see more of that come about as strong legal strategy to address this. That's one thing. And I will caution you to be patient in some of this because we cannot ignore the fact that the courts over the past few years have been stacked with people to ensure that you know this is not going to be an easy win doesn't mean we're not going to try to do it so there's legal strategy i think legal strategy on top of community organizing that has always been in place but also that is now being i think a bit more protected by a additional groups that are coming in and helping so that you don't have people just there on the front lines front lines themselves, but they are backed with funding from other organizations, um, larger organ or, uh, environmental groups that recognize both the relevance and the necessity of supporting um, these, these particular processes. And then the third strategy is, is a political one. It, it is, it just is. Um, this goes back to what I was saying before you have to have people register to vote, running for office, sitting on public commission boards, the actual permitting boards that address this, you have to get into these spaces. It's all for naught if we don't. Everybody here could go and stand on the front lines and we could tie ourselves to the front doors of the corporations, but until we change the board seats and who's sitting in those spaces, it's all for naught. So it, it's a multi-strategy approach, but putting the pieces together is what helps us to achieve that success that much faster. Thank you. And kind of on that thread of civil rights movements, we have a question that says, do you have any advice for having conversations with people who believe in the need for climate action, but brush off the importance of environmental justice and the influence of systemic racism? Mm. Yes. Um, so the first bit of advice I would say is keep talking. Never don't don't ever shut down the conversation. Um, you, you keep engaging in the conversation, but have a conversation and talk about the relevance of climate action and environmental justice at at this time. It's it can be disheartening and disappointing. And this sort of goes into how like people are trying to come back together after being, um, being in such a divisive political space for the past four years. Um, it's quite frankly, a privilege. And I, I will say even a white privilege to think that we can talk about climate action without addressing environmental justice. Because if you can do that means that you have the ability to do that. I, I don't have that luxury. I don't have the luxury of being able to talk about climate action without addressing environmental racism. Why? Because I have been Black my whole life, the entire part, all, all of my life I've been Black. So there's no, way to, there's no way for me to separate that. It cannot be um, dispelled. I have to deal with it. So when I'm having a conversation with people, and I encourage other folks to do this as well, have a real, authentic, genuine, transparent conversation. Attach it to what your experience is, because it helps people to, again, come together and at least listening to why we have these challenges, why we should address these things together, and how it will make us better together. But don't stop talking. That's a great answer. Thank you. 
We have another question here in the chat that says, I very much appreciated your advice to talk to someone from another country where democracy has been at risk. Related to action, what opportunities do you see for us who are Americans to support local climate action in other parts of the world? Yes, yes. Um, you know, help to, to share those stories. Um, we, we're, we're really isolated in North America in terms of understanding the impacts of um, the energy and climate crisis in other parts of the world. It doesn't mean that it's not happening, but we don't see the stories. And often it's important for us to have those conversations around democracy because it will lead to the stories of what's happening in climate action. I will never forget going to um, Nigeria once, um, and, and I've been a couple of times, but this, it, this particular time it struck me, we flew at night and I, was looking out the window and I could see spots of light, like little collectives of light. It, when you're flying in the US, you know, you fly over a city and see almost a whole grid of lights that'll be up. But flying into Lagos, there were like these little spots. And I, I asked the next day, I was like, why does it look like it was just like a little spot of, of electricity in, in these different places? And the response was, well, because there are um, a foreign oil and gas groups or folks who are drilling for natural gas, and they are going to light the place where their people live, but there's no other infrastructure. And that really struck me because it, it showed just how clear there was a taking of natural resources without the benefit of providing infrastructure to the surrounding villages and communities. Well, that same thing happens in the United States. When you look at petrochemical facilities that are in the Gulf or in the um, Ohio, Ohio River Valley area, we see these spots where you have huge facilities that are have come in and are, are sometimes international and have built mega um, spaces for their facilities, um, their workers, they claim to bring all these jobs, but right outside of those gates, the sidewalks are broken. Right outside of those areas, there's crumbled street infrastructure, or the, the municipality that it's technically located in is not even allowed to expand its borders to include that facility and take advantage of the tax revenue. Why? Because the rules have been put in place that they can't do that. So having these conversations across um, demographics and international can help us sort of come to realization that the same thing that's happening in other countries is happening to us. And it helps us to understand again, why it's so important for us to support local climate action in our country, as well as other countries because they're tied together. Thank you. So kind of on that vein of personal decision-making and lifestyle choices, we have two questions that are semi-related but come from different participants. The first one says, what are your thoughts on promoting sustainable plant-based diets as a way to reduce emissions from a policy perspective without being potentially insensitive to marginalized communities? And then the second one says, do you think the tiny home communities are better off for the are better for the environment? And I think that's referring to those small, like just very compact houses, kind of like <laughs> smart cars, but for houses. So I love that first question because you heard in my bio, I love bacon. Like I'm a bacon enthusiast. Um, and uh, I certainly have read all of the reports. I understand very clearly, you know, that going to a plant-based diet is very helpful for our environment. At the same time, I'm telling y'all now, I cannot go to the First Baptist Church in my hometown and tell the, the mother's board that we're not doing chicken anymore. That's not gonna happen. Um, <clears throat> And the reason being is we have to understand and respect culturally how people uh, not only embrace these solutions, but also what moves them, what motivates them. The reason why I think from a policy perspective, we have to be cautious in how we catch, how we phrase this, how we phrase it, is because if we, we have to address a multitude of problems. When, when we talk about, for example, the plant-based diet and it being better for the environment, 
if we don't talk about the cost of food overall and the fact that there are food deserts and poor and in marginalized communities across this country, then we're not addressing the problem because we cannot tell people to go to a plant-based diet and they don't have money to buy food, period. If they don't have the funding or the spaces to find actual good green vegetables that are healthy for them, how dare we tell them that you can only eat a specific thing? And that's been the challenge dating back to enslaved Africans. When we had to, in our own spaces, in our own little plots next to a, uh, the, the cabin in which we live, figure out how to put food in that was going to be helpful to us. So these are not issues that I would say are new to black and brown communities in particular. It's just the fact that we have not addressed the systemic problem of providing healthy food to the community, period. As we're able to do that, then yes, I think we will absolutely be able to a better message about how do we incorporate this. And actually, you know what? It's being done now. It's being done now in a way that's culturally sensitive, that's fun, that identifies with what we do. It's not quite as affordable yet, um, but it's getting there. I mean, come on, how many of y'all have heard of Slutty Vegan out of Atlanta, Georgia, or have stood in a two or three hour line just to get a Slutty Vegan hamburger? Um, why? Because we are figuring out how to make these things identifiable with our culture at the same time trying to address these issues of systemically having food deserts in places for the people who need it. So it's tying these things together that makes the policy better as opposed to um, sort of seeing them in an individual scope. And I am doing better. I will say, y'all, I'm, I'm, I'm cutting back on my bacon, but I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. I'm, I'm working on it. <laughs> Somebody in the chat says that Project. their partner says that bacon is, a, is not a meat, it's a seasoning, and thus does not count. So. <laughs> I, I, I know there was another part of that question and I forgot what it was because like I said it was about tiny houses and like oh, tiny yes, home communities. Yes, yeah. So like, you know, again, I think that goes to what is what what what's helpful in that space, what's helpful for people in that space. Um, if that's what sorry, something is happening over here. Um, <laughs> you know, if that's what for a particular group is helpful, then it's it's something that we can look at in terms of being protective for, for climate or a climate crisis um, housing type of situation. But, you know, let, let's also be guided by history because I remember very clearly when Hurricane Katrina happened and all of a sudden there were all of this FEMA housing that was coming in and people were, you know, be, being put into spaces that were small um, and were supposed to be sort of temporary housing, but they in and of themselves had chemicals and ended up um, having um, adverse impacts to the very people and places that they were intended to help. So I just think, you know, we, we should continue to be creative. I love the idea. I love the creativity of saying this is a possible solution. Let's also look can and can and should be culturally competent to a space um, it would really fit in. Great, thank you. We have a somewhat policy related question that says, in that schools are often the center of the community and yet steeped in systemic racism, can you speak more to the role of educational inequalities as they relate to climate resilience and sustainability? Oh, I just finished writing a chapter on something similar to this. Um, <laughs> so yes. Um, the school, so public schooling as we have known it throughout, you know, our country's um, entire existence has had to deal with issues of segregation and racial inequity. And that has not really been resolved because there's not been a real going back to restore that transition, you know, between um, separate but equal, you know, ensuring that there is really a 
um, that we've addressed those past inequities in terms of um, just what the infrastructure looks like, period. So when we put climate and talk about climate issues on top of that, um, I think what we have to do is account for both the cultural and geographic spaces and needs of these um, of the educational facilities. So for example, it is now saying, you know, since we've, we've all been through COVID and we've seen how there are disparities in infrastructure um, from school buildings to technology to um, even the spaces and how we educate our children. We have to apply all of that now to how um, we should be building out our infrastructure moving forward. I gave I give the example, um, and the reason I said I, I was writing about this, um, I give the example like when I was a kid coming up, how how um, the schools did not have air conditioning, didn't have central heat and air. And I'm in Mississippi, right? So you go into school, you need air conditioning. And when I was in grade school, there were schools that did not have air conditioning. Um, and the schools that did have air conditioning were typically the white schools. So the schools that did not have air conditioning you had lower test scores, you had, um, you know, more behavioral problems, you had issues where, um, you know, the teachers were having to try to make accommodations for the, the environment. And of course, the warmer it gets, the more that you have to do that. Juxtaposed against a school on the other side of town that does have the infrastructure that is able to accommodate their students in a way that's comfortable, um, they have better test scores, right? So this, these things continue on from generation to generation, year after year. As the climate warms and we have more impacts from storms, we have um, more, um, our, our communities are not as resilient, these things get worse. So until we address those systemic problems in terms of infrastructure and look at our future infrastructure through that lens, meaning if you've got a school on the south side of Chicago that you need to redo or rebuild, it has to be done with the idea of climate resiliency in mind. Um, that's helping us to rectify those bad past problems until we're thinking that way, then we're not going to be able to address and, and bring equity to that. But it's the very reason why we do need to, okay? Um, we're, we're still seeing the impacts of that today. Like I said, I, I was in school in, that, in the 80s and there were those problems that exist. It's 2020, 2021 and you've got schools that are in Northern parts of the country that don't have heat. No? Or here's another thing, um, the cost of it is exceeding what the tax, tax base can pay for. So basically that is, you know, schools that are in communities where even the energy grid, the cost of electricity exceeds what they can afford. So shifting to a space where we are addressing climate and environmental needs means addressing the, the energy crisis and the cost of energy. It, it, it's more than just our own homes. It's, it's our school buildings, it's our government buildings. There is a lot. Thank you. And we just have time for one last question. Okay. <laughs> it is, how would you frame climate change for those people and communities that have a science phobia, living in denial, or just addicted to a commercial materialistic lifestyle? There is no rule that says we have to call it climate change. None. Um, the climate has changed. So there's no need for me to try to beat over someone's head and convince them that you know, climate change is real. I think of it um, in the space where I am, which is a very red state. I am a black woman who does environment in Mississippi. It's not a whole lot of us. But that doesn't mean that I don't talk about climate issues in a way that's relevant to people here. Because my friends and neighbors, they know that there's a difference in hunting season because of a change in the environment. The farmers that are in my community know that the, the, the seasons have shifted. 
So we're not ignorant that these things have happened. We just talk about it differently. We talk about conservation. We talk about protective measures from natural disasters like floods and pestilence. Yeah, you know, I come from a space where the boll weevil was made famous because of cotton in Mississippi. So we're no strangers to mosquitoes and bugs. And when they get worse, we know it. Stop putting rules around how you talk about a particular issue, especially climate change. Be creative and address this issue of climate and environment in the same way that the people who are dealing with it address it. I promise you'll, you'll find some synergy if you just change the language. Well, Mrs. McTeer Tony, thank you so much for chatting with us today. We are absolutely privileged to have your wonderful presence here in this virtual room. We really, really appreciate you being here. This was a super, super relevant and helpful discussion and we wanna give you a virtual round of applause. Yay, I wish I could have just, I, you know, I love doing this. This is so wonderful. I hope that I am able to connect and see you all in person. Um, please make sure that we stay in touch. Even everybody who's out here, shoot me a note on Twitter. I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, you'll find me. But it's important to continue these conversations in all of the different spaces and platforms that we have. That's how we, that's how we do better together. So thank you all so much for having me and for all of the amazing questions. They were great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.